Okay, so hello everyone in the room. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce uh, Julian Neri, who did his uh, research internship this summer with us. Um, he's a PhD student at the McGill University in Montreal, um, working on Bayesian inference and thus uh, inference of audio sources. Um, and today he'll present his project on real time single channel speech separation. And with that, uh, Julian, yeah, the floor. Thank you, Sebastian. So I'll be presenting my research project on real time single channel speech separation in noisy and reverberant environments. So a little bit about myself. I'm a PhD candidate at McGill University in Montreal, uh, where I research and teach audio signal processing. My dissertations on hierarchical Bayesian modeling and inference of mixed audio sources. <clears throat> and my advisors at McGill are Philippe DePaul and Roland Badeau at Telecom Paris. First, I'll define the problem that we're addressing and the existing approaches um, that exist. Then I'll present our methodology for addressing the problem. I'll present the results of experiments and, eval and evaluations. And last, I'll make conclusions about the methods pre presented. This research addresses a problem of real-time speech separation. So the goal here is to separate a single channel audio signal containing reverberant speech sources and noise into multiple audio tracks. Each track ideally contains just one of the talkers. This is sometimes referred to as the cocktail party problem. Um, so humans can listen to the voice of one speaker in a room full of many people talking. Um, the room has acoustical properties that reverberate the voices. And there might be some street noise or music playing in the background or restaurant chatter. Um, so that further makes the problem uh, more difficult. So here's an example of an ideal separation system. We're given this mixture. South Carolina Education. And we want the output to be two audio tracks. The South Carolina Educational Radio Network has won national broadcasting awards. Utility analysts, however, expect the agreement to be completed without much difficulty. This is a really challenging problem, um, and it's been the subject of signal processing research for decades. Um, in this research project, we're specifically looking to solve the problem of real time um, single channel separation and further we want to explore if we if we don't assume how many people are speaking in the mixture. So this extra constraint um, being real time requires the system to be causal so not using any feature data um, and with minimal latency. So such a system could then be used in applications like um, teams for automatic dictation and hearing aids to filter out extraneous voices um, and for augmented reality. So the previously the traditional methods were statistical signal processing methods, um, but for separation. Um, but now deep learning has become the main tool for speech separation. The current state of the art models include Conv TASNet, which is a fully convolutional model, um, and SEPFORMER, which is the current state of the art, um, and it uses a pair of transformers. Um, neither of these are made for real-time separation, but they're useful as baselines going forward. Um, Takahashi and Neumann um, worked on recursive systems to separate an unknown number of speakers. And recent work has shown that reverberant separation is much harder than anechoic separation. So even these state-of-the-art models, when you're given reverberant data, um, the quality degrades significantly. Okay, so while state-of-the-art models like SEPFORMER and COMTESTNET um, can perform offline separation, the main challenge is to create compact and causal models that can separate reverberant mixtures at inference time. So CRUISE, on the other hand, um, is a resource-efficient model that's um, proposed by Sebastian um, and others, which can perform real-time speech suppression. 
Um, and so in this project, we ask whether the cruise architecture can be adapted to real-time speech separation as well. So I'll describe the cruise model. Um, so the, it stands for a convolutional recurrent um, UNET architecture for speech enhancement. Um, so this particular model uses, um, uh, it inputs and outputs uh, complex STFT data. So it's transformed by a short time Fourier transform and um, the output is uh, converted back to the time domain with an ISTFT. Okay, um, so it consists of a feature encoder here and a recurrent layer that integrates information over time and a feature decoder, which transforms this uh, latent space back into um, time frequency data. So UNET architectures have skip connections as well that uh, go between the encoder. Uh, so this is a skip connection and the decoder. And so this helps to reconstruct spurious information that might be lost in this uh, bottleneck, this downsampling. So whereas the original cruise model has a single output, um, for separation tasks, we require typically multiple outputs, one for each talker. So here we generalize the model to have K decoders. Um, so to output two, we just have two um, decoders, and these are independent. So they take the same latent space and then pass it through with uh, de different decoders to give two different outputs. Moreover, we consider two types of recurrent networks, the long short-term memory, LSTM, and the efficient but less powerful gated recurrent network, or uh, GRU. So the cruise for speech enhancement uses a very efficient um, GRU, but we wanted to see if LSTMs would help um, at the cost of a little bit more complexity. Okay, so uh, since speech separation de reverb um, from noisy and reverberant input is uh, very challenging, um, an end to end model will need to be more powerful than the original cruise network that was designed for speech um, enhancement. So our proposed way to improve the capacity of the network is to have three sequential LSTMs rather than one. So we're increasing the, the depth of the recurrent network, and we also increase the dimensionality of the, R, of the RNN by two. So while the large n model is attractive for its simple implementation and training, we want to explore more resource efficient architectures as well. So it's been shown that for separation of noisy reverber reverberant speech, the quality of separation can be improved if each task is performed by a separate module. Um, we explored this idea by designing an ensemble of cascaded cruise networks, so smaller than the end-to-end -end, um, individually, um, but they consist of a noise suppressor, um, which is trained just to suppress the noise from a mixture input, <clears throat> A separator, which is trained to separate clean reverberant speech into separate tracks. And then finally, a D reverb, which independently outputs the target speech track given the reverberant track. We tested this using target signals that included the direct path and the early reflection signals. Um, so we first used um, early reflections and the direct path as one target and then we also tried to have a target be just the anechoic so just a direct path signal um, okay. <clears throat> so generalizing this approach to separate more than two mixtures may be done having um, a separator module um, that can recursively process the mixture so at each iteration the separator has two outputs the first output is a reverberated speech um, source, so here. And then the second output is an estimate of the input mixture minus that source. And so this can be applied recursively um, by sending it back into the speech separator, which then ideally outputs another speech source and the residual. And this keeps going until the output here is silent or approximately silent. The idea with these uh, ensemble methods or this cascade method is to pre-train each module separately. So we pre-train this on one task, we pre-train that on one task and so forth. 
and then add, uh, cascade them all together and do a fine tuning after after they're all put together. OK, so in this setup, um, there's two possible configurations that we explored for um, the separator. So we're just looking at the separator module now. Um, the first has two outputs. Uh, one output is a speech source, and the other outputs an estimate of the speech mixture minus that source. So this, again, has two decoders here. Um, but uh, we could also consider um, a slightly more efficient separator, which just has one output. Um, so in this setup, we just output the source estimate and then simply subtract it from the speech mixture to give the residual. So if the input mixture has noise, then this noise is expected to propagate through the network. So this will still have noise and so forth. Whereas um, I guess one benefit of this model is that these two, this output is um, could be further noise suppressing the, the input mixture. So this relies more heavily on the input to be um, noise free. OK, so that's an overview of the model configurations that we were considering. Um, a critical design choice uh, is the optimization criteria to train the model. Um, and for that, we explored two different options. The first option is to use the scale invariant signal to distortion ratio. Um, this is abbreviated SISDR. Uh, and this is a state of the art loss. This is a, a become the more popular loss to, to train speech separation networks. Um, the, target sig the target signal, S here, is scaled um, to minimize the distance, the mean squared distance between um, the target and the estimate. And so the scale is, is changed here. And uh, so the model doesn't have to really learn to output the correct um, overall magnitude of the signal. And so um, the idea is that it could focus more on other details besides the overall volume. Uh, the second option is to use a complex compressed mean squared error, which was uh, proposed by Sebastian and others um, at Microsoft. So this is this is a frequency domain loss, um, and it's been used for speech enhancement and can improve the quality of separation tasks as well. So this loss emulates human hearing as it compares level compressed representations of the target and estimate. Um, this is similar to logarithmic scaling. So when we hear things approximately according to like a logarithmic scale. So it seeks to emulate that um, by exponentiating these, the target and the uh, estimate. So um, it has a higher sensitivity to lower level signals. Um, and in contrast, the SDR has a linear sensitivity and therefore does not weigh the lower levels as much as humans might. So this loss involves a linear combination of the magnitude, a magnitude loss here, um, and uh, a complex loss here. So this weighting parameter lambda and compression factor C can be tuned through optimization um, to kind of find the best trade-off. Um, and it was previously found that for separation, um, having lambda set to one, so a purely complex loss um, is best for separation. Um, and it's in that case, it's a compressed SDR, essentially, um, because if C is equal to one here, then this is um, proportionally even equivalent to um, the mean squared error or the basically not a ratio, but the, the SDR. OK. So using either of the previous losses, the model will learn to represent details of a louder talker more than a quiet talker, um, because the louder talker will contribute more to, to the loss. So it's kind of desirable to be able to trade off um, 
giving some leniency to the louder talker and and be more um, stringent on the lower level talker to increase the intelligibility of it. So that's desirable in some cases. Um, and one way to remedy this um, is to add uh, a scalar value to the to the loss, which is a soft threshold. And um, so in this way, uh, if you threshold it, it prevents. So at a certain point here, so this is using no threshold. Um, so you'll see that the SNR is, is just a line. Um, and the compressed is just a different slope, basically, up to a certain point. Uh, but if we have a threshold of 20 dB, for example, then the loss will not change after approximately 20 dB if SNR is reached. Um, so beyond this, the you know the, we won't really penalize or promote any any training on the model. Um, but on the other hand, um, so if the louder talker already reached 20 SNR and the softer talker um, didn't, which would be the case, um, then the loss will still be affecting the quiet talker. And so um, it'll fine tune that a bit further. So that's the overall idea of this and why it was proposed previously. So we want to experiment with this as well. So now on to the training data we used. Um, our training data is created on the fly using the deep noise suppression data set. Um, so this generates random mixtures of reverberated speech and non-speech noises like whistling and pup noise um, and is augmented through pitch shifting and filtering. Um, there's random silences inserted into the, the tracks as well. Um, and so the reverb is generated uh, with simulated RIRs um, that emulate the speakers in the same room at different positions relative to the microphone. So we're simulating uh, multi speakers in the in a room reverb environment. Uh, the validations that we use is generated in a similar way, um, but offline. And this is using the DAPS corpus for speech and the QUT corpus for noise. So for evaluation, we used uh, several test sets. Um, Whammer, exclamation point, is a recent um, synthetic mixtures test set, which uses the Wall Street Journal speech corpus, which has been around for a long time. Um, it adds real noise recordings to it and adds reverb. Uh, one thing to note that we realized with this is actually um, the, w the Wall Street Journal corpus is quite a noisy data set. So actually the target anechoic signals are noisy. So if you if we have a noise suppression part, which we do, then actually it will um, not match the target very well because it'll it'll get rid of that noise. Uh, OK, and then we have two sets of real recording um, data sets. Uh, so these are actually recorded using a single microphone and re they're recording two talkers in the same room. Um, and there's actually noise also like room noise. Uh, so these, this is great for evaluating um, uh, real life conditions. So both the real M and the uh, fourth DNS challenge are, uh, are real recordings. DNS challenge is kind of like a main talker, so close to the microphone, and then a neighbor um, typo uh, talker, which is further back and quieter. To provide quantitative results of the models, we use um, both separation and speech quality metrics. So we use uh, SDR, SAR, and SIR, but these are intrusive, so you need the ground truth signals. Um, on the other hand, the scale invariant SDR estimator um, is a non-intrusive estimator, so we can actually evaluate it, our models using like real M um, data sets where we don't have ground truth signals. And um, further, we propose this uh, crosstalk kind of uh, estimator because as we don't have an estimator for SIR, the signal to interference ratio, which, which measure, measures how much um, energy from one source is in the other source. Uh, we don't have that for, for real mixtures. So 
um, we propose this crosstalk estimator, which kind of measures the distance between the two um, estimates. And we've actually seen that this provides a pretty similar um, uh, value to SIR um, in a non-intrusive way. OK, so um, for speech quality, we use the DNS MOS um, estimator, which is also non-intrusive. And this gives the signal background and overall mean opinion scores um, to give us an idea of how people would perceive the overall quality of uh, the signals. OK, and finally, uh, before getting to results, um, we compared our methods to the following baselines. So identity function is simply copy the input to the output. Uh, so it doesn't get much simpler than that. Uh, set former um, is the state of the art speech separator. Uh, it's provided by the speech brain package, and, and that's uh, pre-trained on uh, a whammer, which is a huge data set. Um, so after many fine tunings and iterations over different configurations of crews, um, we want to highlight the following um, three real-time separators that we propose and we'll evaluate. Um, the first is the large end-to-end -end model that has three LSTM layers. Um, the second is uh, the ensemble model, which uses a compact noise suppressor, um, which is very similar to the original crews model. Um, a larger separator network. So this is a cruise network with uh, the la a, a bit larger of an R uh, LSTM in it. And then the D reverb, which is kind of a middle ground, um, a bit larger than a noise suppressor, uh, and also using a LSTM. Oh, sorry, actually, we're using a GRU for that. Okay, and then lastly, um, ensemble BAR. It's the same as above. It's the same as the ensemble, except the source separator um, is a, one of those one output separators. So it, sep it just gives an estimate of uh, source and then subtracts the input to give the estimate of the other source. And uh, it's uh, previously called one and rest. Uh, we just referred to it best and rest as separator. So it gives the best estimate and the rest of it. All right. OK, so now we'll present some uh, experiments. That I did to gain some insight into particularities of the proposed models um, just to get some insight into how they're working. Um, so here. I show the behavior of just the D reverb module, so this is after training um, these this module on. Uh, taking a reverberated speech and outputting either the early reflections or just the anechoic. OK, so you can see from the spectrogram this is the input and then this is uh, so this is reverb and in speech input and this is output um, target, which is anechoic. Um, the early reflection output and the anechoic output of the different module. So you'll see that it's uh, quite a bit more attenuated. Uh, we'll just listen to it. So this is the estimate of the early. And if you listen carefully around uh, four seconds in, you can actually hear it kick in. Um, it'll be more uh, obvious for anechoic. We stopped under the willows by Kempton Park and lunched. It is a pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along by the water's edge and overhung by willows. And here's the anechoic. We stopped under the willows by Kempton Park and lunched. It is a pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along by the water's edge and overhung by will. So the <clears throat> signal is much more attenuated here, um, obviously because it, it's uh, removing more of the echo, so there's less energy in, in that estimate. Um, to give a, another view, um, I plot here the encoded latent space. So this is um, the encoding and then after passing it through the rec recurrent network. Um, what I did was just to give kind of a accumulated result. There's probably like 10, 24 dimensions, but I just took the average absolute value and plotted it over time. Um, <clears throat> so 
so you can see basically where this starts to kick in, which you could have you get here. Um, so for the first part, it's they're about equal, and then um, it transfers into this the anechoic um, estimate. Okay, so this warm up period, um, it takes a while to kick in, it is present for the speech separation modules as well. Um, so it's kind of like a natural consequence of the causal recurrent model. It takes some time to um, get adjusted, let's say, to the, the signal. So it's something to just keep in mind for these um, unidirectional networks where we just go forward in time. OK, um, uh, a separation module is trained to separate one speaker and the residual from a mixture of between two and four talkers. So this is um, just to show kind of the feasibility of doing this recursive separation. So the first talker is successfully separated on the first iteration. For so you'll hear the mixture. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by the water on the bank and having nothing to do there. For himself, plus Once or twice, he had. And this is the first estimate. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and having nothing to do. Once or twice, she had. So this first talker is um, decent in quality. There's pretty good separation there, um, but you'll hear on the second recursion. So. Um, we want still just one source. So there's obviously a lot of energy from both speakers in that case. Um, so I'd say for this recurs recursive approach, um, there might need to be some more development. Um, and I talk about that a little bit in the conclusion. So um, for the next parts, we're going to be looking more at real separation, real time separation from two talkers um, and really evaluating that more thoroughly than looking into the, this recursive um, approach. One, one quick question, Julian. Yeah. Um, this, this model is a train just because you're trying to separate your three sources. Mm -hmm. But the model is it just trained on two or is it trained on three sources? Uh, it's trained on between two and four, so I randomly select between two and four speakers. Okay. Um, but this wasn't um, fine tuned afterwards, so it's just um, uh, it might require some fine tuning to kind of learn uh, a degraded input on each recursion rather than a, a true mixture. OK, so here um, it's a, kind of a comparative experiment um, where I simply just uh, shifted one talker forward in time um, just to see if it, our model is uh, basically time shift invariant, um, uh, which uh, I showed. Um, but actually, an interesting thing is that Sepformer's quality degrades um, it, in the case of shifting it, which might suggest that um, since it was trained on Whammer, Whammer, the data set has all the talkers basically start around the same time, so it might actually be overfit to um, to that situation. So I'll just play the estimate here. So I'm just going to play the second estimate for both cases, um, this talker. Alice was beginning to get very tired about having nothing and the crew separator. So this is uh, particularly difficult because this is actually uh, quite um, attenuated, the second source. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by the system and having nothing to So this is something also you'll, you'll hear with um, these models that uh, operate on the time domain signal. Um, there's actually some artifacts here at uh, I think it's one eighth or one sixteenth the sample rate due to non-perfect overlap adding, um, which becomes kind of more prevalent um, in the lower energy signals. So we, act, we find that the 
operating on the time frequency domain, so the SCFT, yet much smoother because we can ensure that the, um, the overlap ad is reconstructing it um, smoothly by using windowing. Okay, so um, here's another experiment where we want to just test the effect of the soft threshold. So we have different thresholds of SNR, um, and um, we have two situations: one where the talkers are at equal volume, and one where one of the talkers is louder than the other. And the main takeaway from this is that when we have one talker that's louder than the other. Um, the 20 dB to 40 dB threshold gives better um, signal quality, so speech quality, according to DNS MOS, which is what we expect. The whole idea of having that threshold is to improve the quality of lower talkers. Um, that's just a small proof of concept there. OK, so. So these next few slides are to uh, show some comparisons between different variable training variables and architecture variables that we have um, uh, going on. So the first, we want to see the difference of using a, a early or anechoic training target. So we see that the train the model to output early reflections as well as the direct path gives better SISDR and uh, speech quality. And this might be because the anechoic target is more difficult to actually learn to output. Um, so it may require a more powerful model to, um, to represent that. Uh, from listening and the previous example, we uh, hear that the anechoic output is more attenuated. Um, so that might also contribute to this. For the architecture, um, we compared the end-to-end -end, and then the two ensemble methods um, using the same training target and the same loss function. So while the larger end-to-end -end model has better speech quality and better separation between the sources, the SISDR is highest for the BAR configuration. Um, and the BAR config has the benefit of having to learn to output just a single talker, which means that there's less information to encode and integrate um, than a dual output model. Um, kind of as expected, there's more crosstalk though for the um, BAR. So higher is better here. Lower value means that there's um, more energy between those sources and the estimates. Okay, so the separation module trained on the SISDR. Um, The SISDR loss has better performance than the CCMSE loss, uh, according to separation and speech quality. So this is only um, affecting the the separation module for the for the noise suppression and the D reverb. We use um, CCMSE, but we just tried different um, loss functions for the the separation, and it seems that SISDR does give a uh, better uh, quality than CCMSE for that module. OK, so now um, for a more overall picture um, of the baseline models and the final cruise configurations. So here the SISDR versus signal quality is plotted. Um, interestingly, for the DAPS um, plus QUT data set, um, which is a, the synthetic validation set, uh, the ensemble methods outperform um, even set former here uh, in terms of SISDR. Um, so that might be because uh, this this set has very reverberant, they even like hall reverbs or sometimes even church reverbs and significant noise, which is not represented in a whammer, which subformer is trained on. So it might just be um, that we trained it on a more difficult uh, data set and thus it can um, handle this kind of data. Uh, for real M, um, it's kind of more obscured what's going on. Um, 
Tepformer, obviously, uh, the better one here. Um, so finally, um, we show some complexity versus performance um, plots. So Stepformer is a very complex model compared to all the propo uh, proposed architectures. So um, it's non-causal also and not meant for real time anyway. Um, the ensemble BAR architecture has the least complexity as it's only one decoder in the separation module. So this one, um, the normal ensemble is slightly more complex and the end to end is um, uh, more complex in both of those, but still uh, much, much more efficient than um, Subformer. Okay, so we show some trade off between complexity and output quality here. Um, notice again that for DAPs, the proposed ensemble methods are both more efficient and better quality than the others. So that's a, a nice takeaway, which you can see here. Um, finally, um, I'll play an example of a real recording. So this is taken from the DNS um, data set. So it's a recording of a talker, background talker, and noise recorded with a single microphone in a room. Um, so this is the mixture signal. We may say of someone, but you need that they were never young. You're so preoccupied that you've let your face grow dim. Boy, it's more over. This is the output of Subformer. We may say of some unfortunates that they were never young. You're so preoccupied that you'll, you've let your face grow dim. Boy, it's more over. Half my feet in front to be both sets in a total of that part of the virus made the blood be found for some time along from the rest. Here's the output of uh, the ensemble method. We may say of some unfortunates that they were never young. You're so preoccupied that you'll, you've let your face grow dim. Boy, it's more over. So I was trained on early reflections, so you can hear it's a little bit more reverberant. How many people refer to the both sex in a total? That's what the ones that made up of the normal And this is the end to end. We may say of some unfortunates that they were never young. You're so preoccupied that you'll, you've let your face grow dim. Boy, it's more over. Uh, and you may hear actually that this takes a bit longer to settle in. Um, there's kind of this transient period in the beginning, uh, which you can hear, I think, more clearly in the second example. And you can see in the spectrogram, which around here, it, it starts to, to settle in, into a stationary state here. So. So actually, the response time of the end to end is a bit longer, it seems, than the ensemble method, which didn't have this transitionary period. Um, so it seems like the response time is a bit faster for the ensemble. OK, so to conclude, um, we address the problem of real time separation of speech in noisy reverberant environments. Um, we presented uh, several different models for that, which are all uh, efficient and have a uh, small amount of look ahead. So real time separation is possible if we use low complexity causal recurrent models. Um, using a cascade of modules provided uh, uh, was beneficial in terms of complexity and separation quality over the end to end model. Uh, so I found that de reverberation was uh, the most challenging aspect of of the entire pipeline and the training target, whether anechoic or early reflections, had a significant effect on the quality of the estimates. Um, from experimenting with different configurations, I found that increasing the size or depth of the recurrent network, uh, so using an LSTM rather than a GRU, was crucial, especially for the D-reverb. Um, soft thresholding, the loss can improve the quality of quiet talkers. And finally, recursive separation in a real-time setting is uh, kind of still an open question. 
likely requiring larger models that might have a longer look ahead to, to sufficiently separate um, more than two speakers. Okay, so finally, I wanna thank um, Sebastian Braun uh, for advising me during my internship, uh, the Audio and Acoustics Research Group, um, the intern program, uh, for hosting us during Redmond Week and uh, MSR Montreal for um, giving me a, a space to, to work um, over the summer. Okay, so feel free in the future to contact me um, on my school email address. And uh, here are my references. So thank you. Awesome. Questions from I can start with one on can you maybe go back to the results slide um we showed this trade off um signal quality versus SDR. Um Oh, uh, one second. Yeah, I know which one now. This one? Yeah, I think this one. Yeah, so what, what, uh, which of the months do you think would offer the, the best trade off here? So obviously, well, yeah. um, set former has, uh, on, on this, so this is top and drill M. Um, or set former has higher SDR and real M. Let's probably just look at the right on the real recordings. Um, so which one would have, uh, would you choose have the best trade-off? So basically, SISDR will give you more the, uh, the separation quality, right? And, and signal will, will measure the, the speech quality. So it seems like... Yeah. For the here, the, yeah, the variance... Uh, for M signal is quite low, and they're all very close. So I guess relatively close. Um, so the the scale between this is 3.3 to 3.6. Um, again, this is an estimator though, so it's uh, kind of um, it it could be kind of more interesting to see if it, uh, a non uh, an actual perceptual results if you had a study. Um, but I would say around here is, I guess, where my eye goes, um, because you have basically um, the midpoint in the, the signal quality, but you have a higher SISDR, it seems. So that would be either the early, uh, both actually both the early ENS bar um, versions. Mm -hmm. So can I ask something, uh, Julian, in the real application, do you expect the separation to be more important? Um, and then allowing other modules to take care of the enhancement of the signal, the separated signals, does that help? Yeah, for real applications, um, I think it seems that the, if you have a person talking quite a bit louder than the other or just in front of the mic, um, it seems like that is, it, it can do that, let's say, but the real the real uh, challenge, it seems, is when you have someone talking really in the background and this attenuated. Um, so probably increasing the intelligibility of that is in important. Um, it seems like separation is, is um, for some reason, like the the D reverb and the speech enhancement is the kind of harder thing to do after separation. Um, it might be due to the compression from the cruise networks, uh, which which tend to kind of give a yeah compressed sound to it, which might affect the intelligibility. But I think yeah, basically, if if, if you could separate as good as possible, then afterwards um, you can apply some uh, speech enhancement to improve the the quality and intelligibility. 
Yeah, so I, I think um, it depends a lot on, on the application and how, where, where you want to use that. So if you think about some live application or some kind of hearing aid or augmented reality application where you just try to make one of the sort or more of the sort is more intelligible, and I guess you will mostly focus on the quality, intelligibility, and if there's a little still crosstalk from another source, it's not as important. While if you look more at the application of like completely separating sources and then doing something else with them, like um, I don't know, uh, like create, creating a new new audio from from a mixture, and where you really want to have no crosstalk between. The audio tracks, and you might want to focus more on the having a more perfect separation. So I think it varies a lot on what you need to choose on the application. Yeah, and I, I think for for yeah, it depends on the what you're doing afterwards. Because if there is some crosstalk, then by well, which what Sebastian was saying, um, if you're trying to do like automatic dictation, then it will affect uh, the results of that. If you have maybe another talker and it, it's not even like having whole words, it's just little um, even fricatives or just little vowels in, in, injected, which really make the intelligibility worse. So that's that's both, you know, that, that's mainly separation, I, I'd think. So it, um, yeah, and especially when they're the same, they have the same kind of timbre. So if it's two people, I, I heard some results when there's two people talking, like, and they have the same kind of pitch. Um, when there's crosstalk in that sense, it's it's harder to interpret what people are saying because the words are kind of jumbled together. Um, so that's also where separation, yeah, it, separation is important. Any more questions from the audience? And I might have another one. So, uh, so it's basically a few contributions that you did here. One on, on the uh, the architecture seems this ensemble uh, method having separate modules is, is beneficial. But then you also showed uh, this thing on the loss where you have this constraint on focusing on lower uh, volume sources. So mm -hmm. if you combine this with the, this is not yet combined with the ensemble, right? It seems yeah. like from this graph, it actually improves this, the overall signal quality, actually. If mm -hmm. you use this constraint, so this could also be even used to even more further improve the ensemble. There are many hyperparameters. <laughs> Not enough compute. Julian, <laughs> uh, does the when you're doing the separation, the speaker separation, uh, does every step of the way have access to the original recording? So no, you only. I suppose I'm thinking, does the error propagate, the error seem to be propagating down, right? Yes. And I wonder yeah. if having access to the original recording as an extra source of information may, may help the yeah. subsequent steps. Or maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> it's hard to say. I think I actually had that thought. It's a really good suggestion. I had that thought maybe last week um, that basically the UNet does that kind of thing. You have a skip connection. But what if there's a skip connection from the original mixture through um, where you concatenate the original mixture with the rest? So it might help, but then again, it's it would have to kind of learn to pick out what from the from the mixture to use. So I think it's definitely it would be an interesting experiment. For someone. Yeah, I think that in my, I would also think that would help. So that's that's actually something I've done in <clears throat> in my echo cancellation task. We have an echo canceller and a noise suppressor, and also added like a skip connection from the uh, input basically to the, the noise suppressor that it ah. still can like, extract uh, features from the action. <clears throat> Um, and one, <clears throat> one other question on the, um, you said that there's this 
pre-training of the separate modules and when you yeah. fine-tune the whole thing um, so you also use separate uh, losses for each stage right or did you just train it on a single loss end-to-end -end loss yeah what i did was um after pre-training each one i first added the noise suppression with the separator and had different separators um, basically running. Um, but I trained that end to end, so I just trained it on separation quality afterwards. And then without, so I froze the, the noise suppressor, so only the, the separator was training. And then after that was done, I added the D reverb, froze the other two, and then trained it end to end. But but and and that means the updated in the weights of all the modules or just the last one? Just the last one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's kind of an open open question. So what's the the better way to do that, right? Because at least the, the, the that's kind of a safe bet, which uh, ensures that still your denoising module <laughs> still keeps the task it's supposed to do, like denoising, and you can just still use it as a single module. But maybe if you still keep on updating the weights, that might also help with the error propagation. That might actually lead to the better results, but then you kind of lose a bit this the usability as individual modules. So that's kind of a bit an open question. Yeah. Right. Any more questions? Have yeah. I have another an auxiliary example if you want to hear it. Just I wasn't sure where I'd be on time. Yeah, please. Uh, this is uh, just to show a more noisy input. Um, so this is actually from Whammer. The companies are followed by at least three analysts that had a minimum five cent change in actual earnings. Sam Rock has interest in television and radio statements, comma, energy services, comma, real estate and venture capital. The companies are followed by at least three analysts and had a minimum five cent change in actual earnings per share. Impressive. That's pretty good. <laughs> the second source is very good. First one is could use a little more intelligibility, but <laughs> yeah, still very very impressive. For like a, I mean, this is what you can do on a single microphone in real time. <laughs> yeah, in this example, they're equal, more equal volumes. So this is, uh, I think, why the second estimate it's it's a bit better than the other one. So. Awesome. Right. No more questions. Then I would say let's thank Julian again. Thank you.